In the words of the great poet Cher, do you believe in life after love? All right, now, I'm not one to pick fights with a legend or anything, but who says that there has to be a time without love at work? Yeah, that's right. Today on Work Trends, we're speaking with author and speaker Steve Farber about why you should try and bring some love to work. And I'm not talking about the kind that gets you reported to HR, okay? Welcome to the Work Trends podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan M. Bureau. Every week, we interview interesting people who are reimagining work. And join us on Twitter every Wednesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, using the hashtag WorkTrends. Today's Work Trends podcast is sponsored by Smart Search. Be sure to visit them at www.aps2k.com to learn more about their new version 21 interface and all the excitement it's creating in the old applicant tracking software space. Let's look at the news first. You know we're big on AI here at Work Trends, so I was absolutely fascinated to read an article in the Harvard Business Review about researchers who used machine learning to study when employees would quit a job. And you know what? The machine learning was actually pretty darn good at figuring it out. I think it ties perfectly to our topic today, it's so important to know who is disengaged at work, right? Who's just not that into you. So you can get to work smothering them with love or maybe figuring out how to re-engage them. We're going to dig deeper with today's guest. Our guest today is Steve Farber. Steve's a speaker, a leadership coach, and an author whose newest book has just been released, It's called, get this, Love is Just Damn Good Business. Now, I know for some of our listeners out there, love is a four-letter word as well, but I think Steve's trying to change that. Steve, welcome. Well, thank you, Megan. But I think no matter how you slice it, love is always going to be four letters. Love is always going to be. There's a lot of other (laughs) four-letter words out there, too. Exactly. Yeah. Where are you right now? Uh, I'm in San Diego. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. It's not not a bad place to be. Now, do you live there? Yeah. Yeah. This, this is where I live. I'm not here by accident. Uh, I moved here with uh, with conscious intent about uh, <laughs> 20 years ago. And yeah, I, I love it here. When you do this kind of work, you just got to be near an airport. So why not, uh, why not live in San Diego? And you've been doing this kind of work for quite a while. Many, many years. Many yeah. years. And you and I know, you and I have a lot of the same friends out there in the world of work. You and I were just catching up in the green room. It's a small world world, huh? Yeah. So I've been at this in one form or another now for 30 years. And I've uh, it's been a great journey. You know, I've had I've had the opportunity to work with just about every kind of company and just about every kind of industry, and and traveling all over and getting a lot of exposure to really great leaders and really. Can I say this night nicely? No, you don't uh, have to. Not. I was just going to say, so Steve. Great leaders. <laughs> nice is also a four letter word, and we can just take that off right now and and just get real with each other. I mean, there's a lot of really crappy leaders out there, right? And we can learn as much, if not more, from them as we can from the great ones. Yes, we can. So as I just mentioned, the title of your new book is Love is Just Damn Good Business. Love really isn't a word we associate with business, unfortunately. What do you mean by love being good business? Yeah, so love and business are not typically not words that you hear uttered in the same sentence, publicly anyway. But when you sit down one-on-one with executives and leaders and people that do, you know, really great work. Uh, you hear, you actually do hear the word quite a bit. I don't know how many times I've had a scenario where, you know, I'll be sitting with, uh, with an executive and I'll say, yeah, so tell me about your team. Oh, I love them. I love my team. They're fantastic. And then he or she will tell me why. And then I can ask the same question to the same person in a different context or in a different format, like for example, in public in front of their team, and then ask the same question. And the answer is, oh, they're great. <laughs> so I think what's we've been conditioned to believe that love has no place in business, but when you cut through the conditioning, what I've seen over and over again throughout these 30 years that I've been wandering about is that not only is love not inappropriate in the context of business, it really is at the core of what great leadership is and is at the core of any great thriving competitive business. But it's not love 
in in the the sentimental you know soft fluffy kind of a way it's more in the lines of love as a business practice as a discipline versus a you know a, a soft abstract feeling and that's the difference that's the key what does it look like in the way you do business is is the exploration that uh, that this book is about and that my work has been about for quite some time what made you decide to write a book about bringing love to the workplace question number 1 Question number two, is this your first book? Uh, no, this is my fourth book. That's what I thought. Yeah. So my first, I've been writing about this since my first book first came out in its first edition in 2004. Uh, so my first book was The Radical Leap, followed up by The Radical Edge and then a book called Greater Than Yourself. So The Radical Leap presents a framework for, for leadership or what I call extreme leadership, which stands for love, energy, audacity, and proof. So I've been out there teaching this, writing about this, consulting on this basis for almost 20 years. But this book is the first time I slapped it on the cover. <laughs> nice. <clears throat> right. So, so in other words, it felt like it was time to, to come front and center with this because it really is at the core of everything that I do. And I, and I believe it's, it uh, presents a really tremendous competitive advantage. But if you were to go to my, my website, if you go to stevefarber.com, it's changing now a little bit because of the new book, but you didn't see Steve Farber, the love guy. Thank it's goodness, Steve Farber by the way. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, you've, right. you've spared all of us. <laughs> the audience and I are grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yet, that's the core of what I teach. So, you know, it doesn't take long to find that. It doesn't take long to dig into it and see that that's really the foundation of it. But I wrote this book in this way uh, to bring the conversation front and center. Because my experience, Megan, is that you say that most of us are, are not accustomed to this or most of us don't, don't like this word love associated with business. I actually don't believe that's true. In, in my experience, this is, this is, I can't prove this, by the way, but it seems to me that most people already know that love is just damn good business. But most people think that most people don't think that that's true. That's so funny. I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. I need more coffee, I think. What did you just <laughs> say? <laughs> no, I get it. Most, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, yes. Okay, I'm going to say yes, Steve, but it, I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to be real with you for a minute. This People do want to go to Fluffy when they hear love, or people want to go to something more, well, intimate in nature, shall I say, which I don't think there's anything wrong with it, just to level set with you. I think it's called culture. I'd like to wake up every morning, frankly, and be in love with just about everything I'm doing, including the people around me. I think it's human to feel that way, but I do think that we've been conditioned, to your point, to want to feel a certain way about business, right? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. We've been, well, actually, we've been conditioned to believe that love has no place in business, uh, that somehow business should be a purely, uh, purely rational endeavor. You know, it's not, it's not personal, it's business, uh, that, that kind of a thing. And I get it and I understand it. And in some, in some contexts, that's, that's true. If we interpret love in a particular way that says, if I love you, then and everything's cool, man. You know, it's all right. You can do what you want because I love you. You can, yeah. if you don't want to show it's up for work, that's cool. Yeah. And that's not love. In other words, we we equate, or it's not the kind of love that I'm talking about. We tend to equate love with weakness, lower expectations, et cetera, in business, in every other aspect of our lives. To your point, we want it. We want to love our kids. We want them to love us. We want to love our spouse. We want them to love us. We want to love our friends. We want them to love us. And then we go to work and suddenly it no longer applies. It doesn't make How any boring. sense. And it's it boring. Make, well, of course right? it is. I mean, honestly, just, just look at it this way. Would you rather, do you think you're going to do better work if you're miserable at work or if you love your work? I mean, who's, who's going to tell me, yeah, listen, the, the conditions for me to, to thrive will be uh, absolute misery and horror. Horror would be good, too. Just you know, well, dreading and, going to And what to we're work. talking about is building a culture of fear, which, you know, a lot of leaders and companies are guilty of, frankly. And, and political leaders, let's throw them, shall we, into the mix. I mean, but fear can only motivate for so long. That's that's the reality there. Yeah. And I don't know that fear actually motivates in the, the greatest sense of the word. It gets you it gets you to do stuff right now to, to protect yourself. But here's here's the thing. Let's just put this in purely business terms. OK, we should all know by now as business people that 
our competitive advantage comes from our customers or clients loving what we do for them. In other words, if they're, we should know by now that if they say they're satisfied with us, that's not enough. There's no competitive advantage that comes from satisfaction. So we want our customers to love our product or service, the experience of working with us. That's where the payoff comes from. That's where the money comes from. That's where the word of mouth comes from. That's where the loyalty comes from, et cetera. So we can, we can all agree on that. So what I'm suggesting is that we need to back that up another couple of steps. In order for that to happen, in order to create an experience for customers that they're going to love in a meaningful and sustainable way over time, we have to create a culture that people love working in. That's the ideal scenario. If we can create a culture that people love working in, where the expectations are high and the standards are high, not only do we have a better chance of creating that experience for our customers, but we're going to attract and retain the best possible talent. Okay. I mean, Steve, this is all fine and dandy, but let's get tactical, shall we? What can leaders do to do this more in the workplace for starts? And then I've got some more questions. Yeah. So let's, um, I'll give you a specific example. Because the, the, the truth is there are thousands of ways to do this. And it's a matter of putting our attention on it with, you know, again, with conscious intent. So there's a, there's a company that I've uh, been, I've been telling their story quite a bit lately uh, because it's, it's such a great example. And it's not a particularly sexy industry. There's a company in Jacksonville, Florida called Trailer Bridge. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just like, I'm in a giggly mood, Steve. Trailer Bridge? Mm-hmm. I love it. I want to hear more. And I'm, I'm being serious now. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, you know, I've said, I've, let me tell you this, Megan. I have said the words Trailer Bridge many times because I tell really? the story a lot. Yeah. And Trailer I've Bridge. Never, I've never heard anybody giggle in response <laughs> Well, to the name of that company. You finally like, met your match. Bridge? That's hilarious. <laughs> it is fun. Oh, come on. The places we can go with this. It's not like Goofy Zone. I mean, Goofy well, Zone would be. So anyway, Trailer Bridge is a shipping company, a shipping and logistics company. They're based in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, so they ship containers of uh, stuff, primarily from the mainland to Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. Uh, they've been in business for 30 years. And their past is toxic, right? So, and what I mean by that is they, um, they had terrible customer scores. They had terrible performance. They went bankrupt. They burned through four CEOs in three years. They burned through four heads of HR in the same period of time. And they were, uh, you know, they were, they were at their, you know, gasping their last breath. And the board tapped uh, one of the managers, a guy named Mitch Luciano, asked him to take over and turn the place around. So he took on the challenge. But he didn't take on the title of CEO in the beginning because he said, for one thing, there's too much baggage associated with that because we get a new CEO every 10 minutes around here. So I will earn the title of CEO. I'll take the title of president. And, and he told his board, I'm just warning you, this is going to be different. And you've got to let me do it the way that I want to do it. And it's going to be different because Mitch is a love guy. So he's coming from the place of how do I operationalize love in this turnaround, in other words, how do we create an environment that people are going to love working in and how are we going to change our, our performance in the marketplace as well? So the first thing was he noticed he, he did hundreds of things. I'll tell you a couple. The first thing was he was coming from a place of belief in his people, right? Uh, he believed that they had the right team for the most part. Some people needed to go. So there is tough love in this as well. But he said, I've got to create an environment where these people need to get to know each other better because the way everything was set up in terms of hierarchy, this was a small company at the time, 120 people. Everybody had their own office. Everybody had their own title. Everybody was you know, buried in their cubicles and everybody walked around with name tags on. So he said, we're a company of 120 people. We should at least know each other's names, including himself. So he got rid of the name tags. Now, on the one hand, that's symbolic. So now it's saying, if we really, listen, if we loved each other, <laughs> we would know each other's names, right? So he did some things with the physical environment, symbolic and structural. So for example, you know, they, they built a couple of communal areas because they had never had that before. So, you know, borrowing ideas from the classic Silicon Valley kind of approach, you know, foosball tables and ping pong tables and that kind of a thing. They bring in a food truck once a week and, and buy lunch for the whole company so people can gather together and get to know each other and eat together. Uh, they lowered the height of the cubicles so people can actually see each other. He challenged all of his managers. Actually, he made it a mandate that even though we have a history of hoarding information, it's the way that he de described it. I love it. it. Uh, we have to start sharing information. Now, why would you share information? 
you are interested in everybody's success, not just your own. And you're interested in our success as a company. And there were people on his management team that absolutely refused to do that. And they were let go. So that's where it started. But then they started to ask this question, or at the same time, they were asking the question about their relationship with their customers. So here's where it gets into really kind of the proverbial brass tacks. And I'm sure they shipped many brass tacks. Not that <laughs> uh, but they looked at their customer policy and they had this longstanding policy that said they would not ship a container. The container would not leave the dock until it was at least 75% full. Because if it was less than 75% full, they would lose money on that shipment. So think about that from the customer's perspective. Okay, You're shipping a car to Puerto Rico for your family. And you tell them it's going to be there on a particular date. And then the company tells you, no, it's not because we're not full enough. We couldn't get enough people to ship stuff on this container. So you're going to have to wait. So they looked at that, among other things, and they said, all right, let's ask this question. If we loved our customers, what would we do? And the answer, when you put it in that context, is pretty clear. We would sail. Yeah, but we're going to lose money on the shipment. So what? We said we're going to sail on that particular date. So we sail. And they, they right then and there, they said, we will sail always, no matter what, unless weather, you know, that kind of thing. So those are a few things. Let me just fast forward and give you the punchline because we could talk about this one case study for hours. Uh, now they have been voted number one and number two couple of years in a row, best place to work in the city of Jacksonville. Nice. Uh, the last two years of this company, since they've turned this place around, the revenue of the last two years of this company is greater than the previous 25 years of the company combined. They're winning all kinds of awards. They are expanding all throughout the country. Uh, they're just killing it, man. I mean, they're, they're lighting it on fire. And if you ask Mitch, and if you ask his senior team, essentially, what is, what is it that you're doing? They will tell you that they're operationalizing love in the way they do business. Love it. I mean, really, I'm, I just said love it, and that came naturally. Uh, uh, yeah, of course. Of course. Now, you're going to find that you're going to hear that word a lot more than you think you do. So the, the other thing, right along the same lines, if you can imagine, this was a place that people hated working not all that long ago. So you can imagine how much money they had to spend on recruiters to get people to work there. They spend no money on recruiters anymore because their own people are their best recruiters because they love working there. And they've actually put their employees through recruiting skills training <laughs> because they're always talking about the place. You just come work here. Well, let's get the right people in the door, not just because you want to want to work with your, you know, your your Aunt Jane or your best friend, but let's teach everybody how to recruit. And they've saved untold amounts. I mean, they can tell you how much money it was. I don't know what it is. So I'll say untold amounts of money. And it just goes on and on. So Steve, what you're really talking about is behavior modeling. Why is that so important for leaders, employees, and everybody in, in there, right? Everybody in the game of culture and making business work. Let's throw in HR professionals, recruiters. Let's, you, can, you can throw everybody into this batch called working for the same goal. Talk to us about how, how behavior modeling plays into this. Well, we've called it any number of things over the years, behavior modeling, leading by example, walking your talk, practicing what you preach, and it's always critical. So from a leadership perspective, so for example, if you look at, at Mitch at, at Trailer Bridge, it wasn't enough for him to go out there uh, on his first day as the de facto CEO and say, okay, we're all going to love each other now, you know? He had to demonstrate it. He had to model it. And one of the ways that he does that, he writes a personal... First of all, he had to learn everybody's names himself, right? I love the, I love the whole name tag example. It's very simple, isn't it? It's so simple, right? And we, we miss it. Why do we miss this humanity, right? So what the thing is, when you, when you start exploring this th through the right question filter, which is, how can I create an environment that people are going to love working in? It sets a higher standard. 
It's a very different question from how do we engage people? How do we motivate people? It's, it's going to lead to the same place. Don't get me wrong. But asking the question, framing it up in that way, raises the standards and the expectations, and it brings out a different answer. So that's how he arrived at that. It seems so obvious once you hear it. But he had to model it himself. He had to learn their names. Uh, he sits down every you know every morning and looks at who's who's got a birthday, and he writes a personal birthday card. He will tell you that if somebody comes and knocks on his office door and says, hey, Mitch, do you have a minute? He knows that it's not going to be a minute. And he always says yes. And he invites them in. He turns off his computer. He spins his chair around, looks at them across, you know, from chair to chair and says, tell me what's up. It's things like that. It's our own personal example. And by the way, that's critical no matter what our position or title is. So it's critical coming from Mitch, who's the CEO in this case, who's turning the place around. But it's true for all of us, whether we're CEO or not. We have an influence on the culture around us. We have an influence on the culture of our team, on the culture of our project, whatever it might be. So if I want this place to be a certain way and this team to behave a certain way, then I've got to be the walking, talking, living, breathing example of exactly what I'm hoping other people will do. That's where it all starts. That's what leadership is. Let's switch things up for a minute. We've been talking a lot about love. I read this great LinkedIn article you posted called How to Love What You're Doing If You Don't Love Your Job. Can you break this down for us on how this is possible? Yeah. So listen, the ideal scenario is is that we we love our work. But let's let, first of all, let me be, be clear. I'm not suggesting that it means loving everything about our work and that everything is flawless and that every aspect of our work is just an absolute joy. Uh, I mean, I love my work, but I don't love airports, and I don't love the mechanics of marketing, and I, there's, I don't love numbers. But there are things that I have to do that I don't love in order to do the work that I love. And the technical term for that is called being an adult, right? So this is about finding that kind of th- that core. So if I ask the question, why do I love this work or this business or this position that I'm in? And the honest answer is, well... I don't. That's a valid answer. This isn't about pretending and putting on a happy face. It's about, you know, the buzzword of the day, of course, is authenticity for all the all the right reasons. For all the buzzword people out there, we're playing buzzword bingo today with Steve, right? So authenticity is 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 really at the core of all of this. Uh, so if you put it aside as a buzzword and think of it as a reality, this isn't about faking it. So a good question to ask, if if I ask the question, why do I love my work and I don't, I can ask a question this way. Well, what, what do I love about it? Can I find something in this mix that I'm really passionate about? So maybe it's, it's, uh, maybe it's my team. Maybe it's the technology that I'm working with. Maybe it's, it's this customer project that I'm on. And if I can put a little bit more attention on that and just, first of all, just acknowledge it, that's a good place to start. But then it gets into, is there a way that I can more fully demonstrate that? So why do I love this? I could be working, I'm just, you know, picking, picking a general scenario. So I'm working on a project and I'm working on it for a particular client. And I really dig this client. I mean, I I love what they do. I think our solution can really help them. They're a pleasure to work with. So allowing myself to acknowledge that feeling then brings me to the next question, which is how can I better show that? How can I better demonstrate that? Similar to what Trailer Bridge with their customers, that it changed their policy. Is there something that I could do in this project that's going to demonstrate that even more? So it's it's starting with what you have. And a, you know, a, a really nice way to do that is just depending on how how deep in this you are, because it can feel very despairing where you know I'm looking around and going, I just can't find anything that I love about this place and I'm I'm miserable. The chances are that you're in the wrong place. That's possible, in which case, you know, a career move might be a good idea. But before you jump to that conclusion, it's really helpful just to take a few minutes and sit back and reflect on why you took this job to begin with. Was there something that that really tripped your trigger in the beginning that maybe you've lost sight of or it's dissipated over the years? For example, I see this a lot. I do a lot of work with educators and I see this a lot with with teachers. They start teaching school because they love kids and they, and they have this uh, what's cynically referred to as starry eyed idealism as to what as to what's possible. And then over the years, it gets beaten out of them because of the bureaucracy and the politics and the, and the limited resources and all kinds of reasons. And then you have a teacher that started out for all loving kids and loving teaching who, who 
finds themselves working at this job because they get the summers off. So sometimes just recalling why I did this to begin with can start to bring that back. And then take an inventory of, of the things that you're really grateful for and the things that you're, you know, you, you, you enjoy doing. Because sometimes the negative overshadows the things that we, we do enjoy to the point that we don't even realize that we enjoy them anymore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Steve, just to sit back, stop, look, and listen, and just look inwards and ask yourself those questions. You have an assessment our listeners can take to find out if they're bringing love to work. Can you tell us how our listeners can do that? Yeah, so if you go to uh, loveisgoodbiz.com, you'll see kind of an overview of, of the new book, and there is a, uh, a self-assessment on there that and it's just, it's a starting point, right? So it's a reflection tool. So it's looking at the elements of LEAP that I mentioned earlier, love, energy, audacity, and proof. We have them broken down into more kind of behavioral behavioral descriptions and so forth. And it'll give you a sense of where you are and, and make some recommendations to you as to how to take that to the next level. So it's a good, yeah, it's a good reflection tool. It's a nice starting place. Well, listen, Steve Farber, thank you for showing us that there are four letter words out there that we can use at work. No, it's been my pleasure, Megan. I really appreciate it. Let's keep the conversation going. Join us for our Work Trends Twitter chat. We are going to be on the Twitters with Steve Farber on Wednesday, October 30th, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, 10.30 a.m. Pacific. Join us to talk about bringing more heart emojis into the workplace. Yeah, and by that I mean love. And if you'd like to get our Twitter chat questions in advance, sign up for our newsletter at talentculture.com. Thanks for listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. Join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter chat with our podcast guest. To learn more about guests featured on today's show, visit the show notes for this episode at talentculture.com and help us spread the word. Subscribe to Work Trends wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating, review, in iTunes. Share Work Trends with your coworkers, your friends. Look forward to it. See you next time. <laughs>